Good evening. I will lecture in English. Uh, I thank you very much for inviting to present work of our practice here, but of course with a special frame. Um, and Ing and you are not with me, but of course I speak also for them in this lecture. And I don't think we ever started one lecture without this title, about this and that and such and so on, because we want to avoid strict visions or strict explanations. But on the other hand, of course, this is a uh, special demand talking about our references. So we will talk and search about references. I tried to order a little bit the rhythm of the evening. And first, I will talk about references that came to our practice, to me personally. And then uh, in three other titles, Carousel Universum and Confessions, I will talk a little bit about how we teach and how we make a kind of research at the ETH in Zurich, also starting from this uh, reference. Maybe I jump over a couple of things depending on the way I can talk this evening. We have a lot of pictures to see. Um, first, I like to talk about one of the main important references to me persons to me that were important from the beginning of my practice from the moment I was a student, and that's the person of René Heyfart, a Belgian-Flemish architect and artist at the same time, maybe at the end, finally an artist. I just show first some pictures of the work of Heyfart. When I was a student, the work of Heyfart was not that much documented. This is one of the most first initial very thin booklets that appeared on his work. I knew the house at that moment already for a long time. And I used to cycle on Sunday afternoon to pass by and see the house. This is the house. It's a house that uh, Hevart built for his brother, Gilbert. It's way back in the 50s. It's in uh, the surroundings of Ghent. And what you see is, in fact, where it is about. To me, this house shares a couple of things. First of all, Hevart was interested in making a house that he could build himself together with his brother. So they used very, let's say, available materials at that time. The house needed to be cheap, although I don't like the word. Secondly, also, Hevart was interested in a new way of trying to catch life. I think this photograph of the house in which you see a young daughter is where it is about. Hevart traveled around, informed himself, and for Flanders at that time, he introduced quite new ideas on modernity, or say local modernity. And thirdly, which is visible in this photograph, you see Yet the first art pieces Hevart is about to make at that moment. This nice booklet, framed like you see in original gray-white pictures, black-white pictures, at the same time, it also gives us insight on how the house was at that time, way back 15 years ago. I introduce you in the next book, which is now about 10 years old. It's finally a monograph that appeared on the work of René Heyfart. And I just make snapshots. I think that's nice enough to look in a book. I love books, and it's also good to show it in that way. Again, the house, like it used to be visible seven years ago. What you see, Heyfart lifted the house, because we are in the wetlands around the city. And by lifting the house, he was able to look over the dikes towards the Schelde, at the same time also protect the house from humidity. But below the house, there was a workspace for his brother. And everything, like life should be, came together, though it had been constructed with new ideas of that time, or for that time, or for that place, and with new materials or experiments with materials. In this book, this house is, again, very good documented. Even the details of the corners, which were very well studied, were present. But this book also delivers what I called the dilemma of Hevart's life. And I believe it's a dilemma which is 
very interesting also for an architect, meaning that distance between architecture and art. Have art produced some more work, like this very beautiful apartment building, in which you can see also how much he was concerned in the composition of things, and some other small houses which always deal with a kind of light structure, but also a kind of position towards nature. Even Havart, when he started to travel, came to America, and this building still exists. He worked as an intern at an architecture practice. The name drops out of my mind. And uh, it seems that the entrance, this lobby of this building, which was for an insurance company, the color scheme, or let's say the color project, had to be from the hand of Hevart. It seems to be still there, as I found it back on Google Earth, driving around in the streets. But there it happens. Hevart moves around the world, and he starts to be doubtful about his architectural position. And at the end, his oeuvre as architect is not much more than like seven buildings. But then he starts to be more interested in this kind. And he starts to make drawings. He starts to make work. And he keeps on going with it. And I could frame this work, of course, also in the tradition of that time. And I could refer, for example, also to Dan van Severen, the grandfather of David or the father of Martin van Severen. And you will recognize work in that. But maybe away from this work, he started to become more and more artist. And this is a very nice page, I believe, in which he said, I will create myself a kingdom. So I continue just showing some works, very, very, I would say, like an artist in the beginning. But then I think he started to reveal himself much more his own doubtful position. This is also a very beautiful page in which he writes, uh, I sleep too much, I sleep too less. I work too much, I work too less. I think too much, I think too less, and so on, and so on. And he started to make collages of visits around the world, of just observations, to arrive maybe at this final work. As I believe that his architectural oeuvre has much to do with the scale of the human person, the, as of the humanity itself, the scale, the proportions, the use of material, I believe at this phase in his production as an artist, he starts to deal with that again. He takes simple materials, simple objects, simple things from around, and he brings them together in a doubtful, sometimes even painful, you see these wooden sticks together with the branches. But he starts to bring things together like I believe he did in a very simple way in his house. So this work to me as a young um, architect at that time, student even, not documented that much at that time. I had to go talk with people and find out. I have to admit, it always stayed with me, and I do believe it influenced my development, my way of walking and thinking, still yet today. I can illustrate it with a project of us. This is a really typically Flemish house around the countryside. It's a house inherited by a young couple, in fact, too early in their life from their family, and they needed to refurbish it. They had no money, but they didn't want to lose the house. We made a project for them, and this is the house, as good as finished, except some, some scaffolding still. But it looks like this today, except, of course, there are a lot of trees it's a nice garden around. And what we did is that together with the young people, Pete and Alan, we developed a kind of bringing together of materials, greenhouse formwork of this typically Swiss brand Doka. And we made a kind of project, a glazed house in the original house. They could build themselves and by which they could live the house differently season to season, or even mood to mood. So we worked three years along with them on the house, 
Every other weekend, we descended down to talk and design and to decide with them together every other detail, change the project constantly, but to arrive in this kind of glazed house. Very well conditioned in the glazed house, not conditioned outside the glazed house, but whatever, what does it mind? Because always the whole body of the house was visible. And if we took away a floor, like we can see with the concrete, the concrete um, uh, beam around, we just uh, made a formwork with the old planks of the house. And the house is full of this kind of ideas, but the house also starts with the idea how to make a house to live in and how to make a house one can make himself. Some more pictures. But it's not only about this, this house. Pete and Ellen, when they contacted us, the first question Pete asked me, is it possible that you know the work of René Heivart? This is the same house. The glazed house in the house is loose from its perimeter walls, from its facade walls, except one wall we had to touch because of the organization of space. But this was a beautiful wall. Maybe this photograph does not really give it, but it's an old brickwork, an old Flemish brick, a little bit rained out, but beauty is itself. Though we had to insulate it. Of course, we have to fill, fill all energetic requirements as it goes today. But we were fascinated together with Peter and Ellen about the beautiness of the wall. And we made a lots of drawings. Of course, we had to insulate it, but we arrived with this. We insulated it, and we wanted to cover it with salmon tiles, as you see, all along Flanders. But then, at the same time, we were interested in how we eventually could reflect the wall in its aspect of beautiness only upon the salmon tiles. So we worked like this. We started to make all kinds of tests in how to represent it to finally arrive at this only simple moment of um, um, tiles, beautiful tiles uh, of drawings on those tiles. So some weekends with a client, those tiles were all pre-drawn and then later on attached to the house. It's maybe not that much and probably not too much people will see it. You have to approach it and then you might discover it. It's like reading a book with the black letters or reading the book with the white lines in between. But just this pleasure to reflect on those things, I do think that I'm a little bit, have to say, remember or go back to Hevart to admit some things. And this is the house, the original house. We did not change it that much. We discovered, rediscovered the red paint, we brought it back. And under the attic, we needed to have some space to live. And so we needed light and we added an extra dormer which we mirrored out as we didn't want to add anything on the other hand. And the design of the window is no more no less than the copy of the trompe l'oeil window at the first level. I go back to the house of René Heifard for his brother Gilbert. A couple of years ago, like five years ago, Gilbert was aging, getting 90, and he got it difficult to get up and down the house constantly. So he decided himself, without any architect, to close down the below part of the house and, in fact, as good as copied the whole plan of the, below, of the above house below. The ceiling is far too low, but that made for him the house comfortable. A lot of architectural crits and people who love the work of René were furious. They did not understood that he could do that to this work of his brother. Anyway, it was like that. It was too late. But next to that, he rented out the above part for so-called artist in residentship. He organized this together with uh, Anna Heifert, his daughter. And that gave us, at a certain part, the moment we were invited, to, to have the house for one and a half months, I mean, the above part. And we went down 
with students. And honestly, though a lot of people um, uh, didn't like what Gilbert did to the house, I was not sure that it was so bad. And together with students, we did the research work on the original status of the house, and we made a model in which we really uh, detailed every construction detail and so on, like it was in its beginning status. Next to that, we made a model of the house as it is. And to us, or to me, was the point to say like, well, going back to the idea of Hevart being so human, in, humanly interested in how architecture should be, I could believe almost that René Herwart, if he would still be alive, would have accepted what his brother did, maybe he even would have helped it. It stayed there and the debate was open, and this debate of course goes along with the idea on how to preserve this kind of architecture. Nowadays it's a very actual debate, and there was a small show in the house showing off the models, opening the debate amongst people. Recently, there were many artists and architects who stayed for a while. Recently, the above part has been restored. It has been restored by Peter Swinnen, formerly uh, 51 and 4A architects and Flemish Baumeister. And Peter Swinnen dared to change. And I don't believe he did it wrong. You see here the entrance again. He dared to keep the things as they were, like the shipboard walls and the shipboard ceiling, but he also dared to add new things, like the curtains or like a movable sliding door to the left. But on the other hand, he brought it quite originally back to its original status. Once again, people did not agree on the minus change he brought to the building, but I believe again this is really like probably Hevart, René Hevart, would have done himself, exploring new things, inter, um, introducing new things like he did in the original house. So this is my first, I could say, confession on reference on an architecture product, production that stayed very close to me. And I add just a few more things. Reference as dilemma, and I mean the dilemma of what Hevart was, being the architect, being the artist, and in between maybe the link with the human scale and interest in the project. What I really maybe personally made out of it, but what I merely appreciate. Some other examples, and coming back to Hevart soon, because I want to talk about this cupboard on the left side. You see here three shelving system cupboards. And on the middle, you see a copy we made of a piece of furniture of Martin van Severen, and a little bit more to the right, a copy of a piece of furniture of Eames. Well, we, we did some exercising, some testing in it, because we started from a standard product, and we bought kind of different brands, and we recompiled them to these pieces of furniture, you could call it and they were called Ode or Homage to one or the other. It are exercises we make. And if I just stay one more minute with the one of Martin van Severen, you see here a photograph on the left side, you see of Martin, the original one, which is very nicely made in aluminium, no tolerance, the sliding doors are precisely moving, the choice of colors has been taken half a lifetime to decide. But on the right side, you see in the Museum of Design in Ghent, our version next to the one of Martin on show. And we had to deal with the standard product with a lot of tolerances. And we just wanted to add the same type of colors, but not by really selecting the colors, but by letting materials speak with the colors as they are. And then we had to find a way to really connect it and make it sliding doors. It's again about the idea of trying to understand the references, the things you're looking at, and working them out in a different way. And we were happy when the first evening of the opening, the preview, the, the former wife of Martin came along, and she bought number one of this uh, copy, saying that she not only liked it as such, 
But she said also to me that Maarten always wanted to make something with that brand of metal shelving. He was obsessed, but he unfortunately could not uh, come to that anymore in its life. Well, it was an ensemble of three cupboards. I do not go into detail of the Eames one, but I just present now slightly the third one, which was an homage to Evart. And we made a cupboard which is maybe more a model of a, a, a kind of model of a building almost, also explaining by that that making those objects, we are not designers, we like to make them like buildings anyway. But here we collected, you remember from the beginning that I showed all this checkered paper exercise. We covered all those shelves with different types of exercise. You can move in, you can move out. And we call it a kind of final homage for Hevart. So, this was first part as dilemma, Hevart as central figure. Second part, references as maybe they don't want to be used. The first, Soluit. It's a photograph I took about, uh, I think, 30 years ago almost. No, not possible, 25 years ago. And it's a drawing of Soluit in a porch house entry in a former gallery in Ghent. And at a certain moment, the gallery moves out and the drawing stays there. The building is sold. It's a called so-called city palace. It's a huge city house. And the new landlord changed all the rooms to 23 student studios. And so he asked this electrician to install 23 doorbells and a light switch. Of course, this is on one hand, yeah, a disaster, killing this beautiness. The electrician possibly did not know what this was about. On the other hand, something strange happens. That is that finally the electrician let himself guide by the drawing. The light bells are nicely lined up and the door switch just touches the point of the drawing. It kept on following me and maybe still it's still following me this today. But anyway, we did something unexpected with it. This is a collage drawing of a bus stop we realized in Austria. It's a series of bus stops many people have been invited in and we were allowed or demanded to make one. And I have to say this was the original place of the bus stop and it does not really speak in terms of inspiration. So, like one week before we had to deliver the preliminary design, we still didn't have anything. And what you see here are video stills from a small video that we have sent to the client. It took like one minute and 40 seconds, I believe. And we went back to the first book we ever made on our thinking, on our work. And at the first pages of that book, you have those two photographs I just came to show. And we cut them out and we folded them to a certain roof. So maybe we were not better than the electrician. Possibly not. But this is the bus stop as it is right now over there. And somehow we felt like now we are, we've done the same fault as the electrician. We, we are ready with the solo with. I like it somehow because what I like very much about the project is that maybe contrast to the, Rene Hever, to the Rotlenberg house for Pete and Allen where everything was very precisely thought out of the context of possibilities, the context itself, the context of people. Drawing this bus stop seems to be a kind of fully, starting from another mistake from someone else regarding a soluid drawing. But what I like about it, that the people really appreciate it. It's one of the bus stops that really give shelter. The other are really beautiful, but sometimes they don't give shelter. And they call it a chapel, and it's nice that the chapel is not only a religious symbol in the mountains, but also a place people could hide when the weather changed in the mountains. But finally, at the end, although I thought we got rid of it, being inside it, or maybe I just have to say something else again, we didn't re did really research on it when we made this photograph so many years ago. But on the occasion of the bus stop, we went back to Soluitz and we studied a little bit more. And of course, we could have 
thought about it, but those drawings seem to be part of a series called pyramid drawings. Anyway, being back in the bus stop, we photographed it like this. And though we thought we were ready with the soluit, it was like it was coming back to us. Soluit kept on following us, and maybe the next thing. As mentioned, about columns, and later on soluit. Where we shoved off those cupboards that I came to explain 10 minutes ago, this was the gallery where we showed it. And this is, of course, like gallery, galleries are always, wide spaces, open spaces, everything so-called for you. But if you are there like two, three times, we felt like not ready with that space. It felt unbalanced for us. So we proposed to change the place and we proposed to the gallerist to add four more concrete columns, not because there was a problem with the stability, but because we believed that it made the place better, differently. She refused, so finally we installed four columns as a decor as we have seen how we installed them, together with the real metal pools and then around the chipboard painted white. No one could feel they were different than the others, but everyone felt immediately the space was in a totally other balance. This idea kept us following, and maybe also this false column had something to do with the electrician in the Solue drawing. And it came back to us when we had now, I believe, two or three years ago, the invitation of the ETH in Zurich, or let's say the GTH exhibition, run by Niels Olsen and Freddy Fischli, to, to show our work at ETH. This was our first meeting at ETH. We were very happy with that, but when we arrived, we were confronted with this exhibition space, which was not really motivating to us. So we proposed a series of seven interventions in the space to make the space better. I will not explain those ex this, uh, intervention, interventions all together, only one, which goes accordingly the idea of soluit. Well, maybe two. Uh, for example, you see the, the ceiling above, which has this zit-shaped triplex panels. No one understands why they are like this. Well, we, we, we descended them and we could use them then as a display for drawings and books. I will show that later. But what I wanted to talk about is this column in the middle. The initial idea was that we would take away the plasterboard panels from around the column and exhibit the real structure of the building in metal and HEB profile. We were allowed first, but then later on not, because for that you need a building permit, and fire department came along and it would take about, in Swiss terms, fast two years. So we couldn't let that happen, and we made a drawing of it on the column. And the drawing had been made, not exactly like Soloit would do it, but of course we were somehow totally inspired by it. It's made by pencil. And it's a kind of false perspective. On one hand, you look into the hollowness of the HEB column. On the other hand, you look left and right. We wanted to exhibit it like this, and all the interventions in the space became more one-to-one -one models of a possible intervention than a final intervention. But we could, couldn't care. You see, the space was totally different. There may be a nice story to tell about those columns. There were eight of them. And uh, when you are in Belgium, you, of course, initiate students for that, and they love to do it. Also, the Zurich students loved to do it. But then we got an uh, invoice, well, we got a proposal, and it was 12,000 Swiss franc to let students work, that we were surprised. But we learned that they had to be paid 30 Swiss francs an hour. So although we had a huge budget, budgets goes always fast in Zurich, so we changed the mind and we said, like, maybe we will ask each important teacher at the school to do a kind of patronage of such a column. So all the teachers did it themselves for free. We even had to invent more columns because some were complaining they were not invited. You will see later on. Anyway, it kept us ongoing with those ideas of elements in architecture that could fade away from their real meaning, like here you see a setting in the gallery in, in Brussels where you can now, now buy those columns if you want. We come at your home and we help to arrange them 
at home. So even the white middle column is not the real one. This was what was on show in Chicago at the Biennale, as a kind of ensemble of columns looking for space. Last thing, maybe, which can be connected to the reference of Soluit and this almost stupid photographs. Some ideas of the building site. At a certain moment, we ask the contractor not to finish the hangs of the door, as we love this beautiful preparation to install it. In another house, we had to change the electricity lining, and then by that, you have to damage things. Was impossible not to. But then finally, we added throughout the house always a white surface to show off the change. In another house, we needed to support a beam, like you see above, a beam we made ourselves. But we didn't want a column. And we just reinforced it with the, map, with the metal armature, which is normally in oversized to keep the concrete away, but to deal with the drawing of the window of the neighbor next door. We are ready with Soluit, but maybe some other references that do not want to be used in the way we use it. Villa Tugendhat, Miss, I don't have to explain how important this piece, masterpiece is, but not only for Miss, but also in European history. Anyway, this is a photograph I took uh, a moment, um, a week before they closed down the villa for restoration. And Inge and I, we took a whole set of photographs of all kinds of details which were in our interest. Also a little bit scared that after the renovation, maybe the house might have um, um, lost those traces. And this is beautiful. This is this handrail. When you walk down, it's in chrome. It was damaged throughout the history, and someone repaired it with a silver tape. And it reveals a beautiness, the very rich chrome and the very cheap silver tape. For that gallery, we made an object which we call the silver table, and it's a black metal polished with diamonds. And then you have what you see in the above table, a beautiful mirror. And then normally you lock it with chrome, but that's what we did not do. And if you don't lock it, it depends on how you treat it. Some people really have a dry cloth and clean it every day, and it stays mirroring. But if you keep it just uncleaned, it starts to be rusty again. We love that. We love that beautiness of that handrail in Villa Tugendhat. And then some people have a party and forget to take away the glasses and find their table the next day like this. But it's about traces. It's like the electrician. It's like the handrail. It comes back. And finally, it is nice to discover that after the restoration, the handrail was not restored. Vice versa happened the opposite way. You've seen that pool laying in between those columns in Chicago or at this photograph. And we taped it with silver tape by which it all of a sudden becomes a very beautiness itself. You will not use it at the building site, but you might like to have it at your house. And you can buy it with a golden clang and a silver clang, or also a tape clang, depending on your budget. And we presented it also at the last Venice Biennale, where we curated the Belgian pavilion. And not too many people found their way, but behind the Belgian pavilion, there is a very nice old barn though it was like about to collapse. On that occasion, we added a couple of those silver pools. In fact, we bought them in Venice and we taped them over there. But we found it delivered the beautiness itself. And I should have had here a small photograph of Brancusi. It would not have been misunderstood as photographs of his studio, at least. Last reference, as it does not want to be used, I'm also happy to bring this evening some work of Flemish references you might not know. And this is a work of the uh, Flemish designer. His name is Pieter de Bruyne. 
you won't be surprised if I catalog his work at a certain moment in a postmodern atmosphere. This is a cupboard he designed, and it's called Day and Night. And this uh, cupboard, well, it serves. You can open it. It has some doors, but on the other hand, it doesn't serve at all. It's an object. But it was a time we were fascinated with it, like four or five years ago. And at that time, we got from a Dutch brand a question to design acoustic furniture. We four office spaces. We could not understand it very well, but being completely fascinated by Peter de Bruyne, we did something, starting from a plasterboard wall, which you have normally in between offices, we deconstructed it into a copy of this furniture. And we amused ourselves very much because we started from all the elements of this plasterboard walls, the aluminium profiles, the perforated plasterboard and whatever, but we made a cupboard that could work. It had everything, still the insulation parts. It has also the white marble parts like Peter de Bruyne. But finally, we did not design a special cupboard. We just take over our obsession of that postmodern part of Peter de Bruyne. Now, the client or the, the brand who asked us to design the cupboard gave it back to us because he couldn't do anything with it, which I don't find surprisingly. But now it travels from museum to gallery and so on, together with a piece of Peter de Bruyne. It's here the first time at Luma in Zurich uh, visible, and it's a triptych installation together with a model of a house. Because at that time, we were refurnishing a small house, and the house is like this. It's a very small house out of the 50. The client wanted to have an open space, and we thought it was not good to make a loft from a simple house. Though we made a construction in all the openings of the houses, we made a wooden construction that support the house, and then we took away the walls, even let drop and fall the bricks. But in the construction, you have this kind of triangular forcing. And when we were there at the building site, we felt something was missing. And as Peter de Bruyne was still in our mind, and we just had made that cupboard, we added the same color systematic and added few lines, which have no constructual meaning at all. Let's say, hopefully, our last postmodern reflex. But anyway, it's saying references they didn't or they don't want to be used. And then all of a sudden, they appear to you, and they happen to you and you just let it happen in your work. Third thing on references, the dilemma of Hevert, I hope it was clear enough, and then the, let's say, small amusement with all kind of references that go in another way around. Maybe just like some example of people who brought our work somehow in relation with references around. I think I have to admit, uh, discovering also the work of Florian Beigel and Philip Christou. I did that a um, couple of years ago, well, when I was studying still. There was at that time a fantastic, it's still there, but at that time a legendary quaderns, Portuguese, uh, yeah, Spanish, uh, um, sorry, a review, in which I discovered this work, which does not exist anymore today, of uh, Florian Beigel and Philip Christou, the Half Moon Theatre, which I wrongly framed as the Blue Moon Theatre very much, especially when I see Florian, and then he's always a little bit mad. But um, after, it's not that I could bring this in a direct relation to something we made, and it's the buildings for the dance company Le Ballet de la Baie from Alain Platel and Music Lot. But I have to admit that when one sees this picture and one goes back to the picture of the Half Moon Theatre, I cannot say that there is no relation in thinking or working. It became a friendship with Florian and Phil in the meantime, and we, will have, we are happy that we will soon work uh, on demand of quadrants to work out this idea between the two buildings in a small exhibition soon. Another reference which struck me two years ago at the Venice Biennale, Eduardo Suto de Moura, the market, when I was a student, it really inspired me. It really was interesting, not only because of its design, but the idea that 
a market could be built. Of course, there are a lot of references around, but I, I liked it very much. And then 2016, I walk into a space at the Giardini, and then you see those photographs of a deconstructed market by Soto de Mura himself, as the market was out of use. It brings me to uh, a project we are working on right now. It uh, will start the building phase by this summer. What you see is an old photograph of the project. It's a refurbishment of a Palais des Expos in Charleroi, the French-speaking part of Belgium. And in Charleroi, they built themselves in the middle of the city this 60,000 square meter expo hall. Charleroi was known till the 70s for its heavy metal industry, as you can see on the photograph. We are now uptown, and you see in the landscape the terrels, which are, of course, typically for this industry. And what you see is a building site photograph. On the left and the right side, you see the big holes, 45,000 square meters altogether, over three levels of nine meters high. So part of the building is below level as the city is in a slope. And then the middle part is the entrance building, 12,000 square meters big. There was a competition, and the competition was, funny to say, uh, in, the six, in the 70s, when the building was finished, the whole industry went bankrupt. So they never used the Palais Expo in full capacity. So it stayed there, mostly without use. And then 40 years later, Charleroi got from European community money to invest in their region as there was no activity anymore. And they used part of the money to launch a competition. And the competition asked to renovate the central part, the entrance, and to give it a new architectural outlook. And there was no money to recover the other parts of the building. We changed that. And we said it was better not to make a new architectural project for the middle, but just to strip the whole building and leave it as a structure, as a kind of urban structure, to keep it open between the up and downtown difference, and to have new trees spark in it, and to have a new experience between the up and downtown. And by that, we could save money to renovate at least one of the halls in a technical way. We were finishing this, we, we won this competition the moment that we discovered the Venice um, project of Soto de Mura. Well, Kerstin, you know, we all know him, and then he often tries to frame our work. And uh, he is, of course, also obsessed by Venturi. And he just recently wrote this text, The Difficult Hole, in which, without really pointing to it, he illustrates the whole thing, the text. And then at the end, he just adds on the left side some pictures of our work. It's not for the first time he does that, because he wrote uh, a more extensively text on that. And I don't want to... to, to um, to refer myself to it, you can find it back. But I like to put next to that of Kerstin and House. Those, is, those are not photographs of Philippe Dujardin, I should say this. Uh, a house in Bruges, where we are now finishing a new house, but again dealing with the idea of the chimney and the way we can work with the old parts, like the beam, the wooden beam that does not function anymore but how it's related to the structural metal beam above, or like how old secondary beams are combined with new beams. I just like to show it. It would be better photographed, I think. But on the other hand, it just shows off another totally other project we're working on right now, totally different than the house of Peter and Helen, maybe. It's not self-built. On the other hand, it's also about trying to understand the history of the house and so on together with the idea of how to just simply live a nice house, by which you can look throughout different levels to the garden, which is, goes along with it. Looking up, combining the old and the new, introducing form just as a pleasure of form into the house. Even the garden became a pleasure to make it, restoring the old walls 
having to add few elements and then just lining out all the changes we made to arrive at a certain, let's say, drawing. That idea of the drawing that I just came to show off already in the slides at the side of the house of Peter and Allen, it always comes back at the end in the final decisions. Also, Kerstin invited me once at APFL to talk about our work regarding Eric Owen Moss' work. So anyway, I took, uh, Kerstin uh, pointed me out at uh, Book Constructions of Eric Owen Moss and asked me to come and bring one project particularly, which is the project we made for the city of Ghent. It's an old townhouse of the city of Ledeberg, but city of Ledeberg is part of the city of Ghent. And maybe I'm just happy to show you some pictures of it that related Kerstin to Moss. If I like it or not, I don't know. But anyway, why is, of course, uh, Kerstin told me, because of the way we were working with the different elements of the building to become separate identities, but then to be combined with each other, like the concrete beams, the metal beams, the concrete columns, and maybe also the idea of the small mirror ornament that goes together with it, in which we again detached and reconstructed how elements come together. Um, you can see it also in, in this part of the building, which is a restored part of the building, in which on one hand the left column is in fact the decoration column, while the right column we added is a column we needed to reinforce the floors above. So I add this series of photographs because it is about people bringing us in reference towards other one's work, though it was not initially a reference to us. I like to tell the story about these red paints, which starts with this picture. The concrete was not well done. The client, the city of Ghent, refused the concrete. The contractor refused to accept the refusal. So the, the, the whole the uh, building site should stop until the moment we came with the idea that maybe we can work it in another way and we could emphasize the oldest simple faults and find a new language to go along with this. And by this, this became a total language throughout the building in which sometimes you connect things that were not expected to come together in a visual work together. We walk outside the building it's a historical building, but we had to add a lot of extra equipment, rooms, uh, elevators, staircases for escape, and we made this composition. Anyway, it was Kerstin's decision to bring it to Moss. Moritz Kuhn once brought our work together, maybe not unexpectedly and maybe a little bit straight away, but then it is like this with René Magritte's work. And he made quite an effort to select paintings and fragments of our work. You have a better view onto this. No one is ever has a problem to be brought in relation with Magritte, I think, especially as I'm a Belgian guy. And I could bring another work of us next to that, which is a very small work, and you can see here what happens? It's a wall which we painted. It's a simple demand of a client to replace an old loggia by a new kind of greenhouse and to make an addition for a kitchen in the house. And the idea is like this. This was the way we found the house. You see the old loggia which was closed down to a kind of greenhouse, let's say. And especially our interest went to this photograph, the old family photograph of the previous owner. And you see there the loggia in all its glorious status, but you see also on the wall a drawing. The drawing is the continuation of the construction. So finally, we delivered a kitchen, which is in front of here, a copy of the idea of the loggia, and we made a new loggia at the right side, and they present themselves like this. And the roof, uh, sorry, the wall, I didn't point that, but on the photographs you can see, the wall was covered with those cement tiles. And we took them away and we restored the wall. 
we just repainted the tiles on it. It became the inverse project of how we found the building. At the same time, the idea of the loggias was just the double loggia as it comes back. Maybe a total other thing, and I bring it myself, I don't take the excuse of Kersten of Moritz or who else. It's something, and I could take others, but now I take Peter Merkley's drawings. I do think for our practice, and I will show some later drawings on projects also, this drawing is very important. I mean, the way Peter also make those drawings related and non-related to projects, it's sometimes also with architects today that we think drawing is just an instrument to make what we want to make, but it has, for me, also a free status as many times. We make drawings related also, but also just drawings because of the pleasure, like, for example, those examples that came after the Venice Biennale, or this kind of drawings, this time related to a project, but at the other time also drawings that just can stay by themselves. Or just drawings like this one that leads to nothing, but which is just about thinking of walls and insulation parts and bigger and smaller stones, or drawings of details for a table we will make soon or maybe never, or a sleepless night in a kitchen that arrives to become drawings of a totally other abstract moment. Just those drawings, they go along with our practice without any mean, without any goal, but they always influence the others. And maybe as a last kind of reference that just goes along, Lurchens, also Kersten at a certain point brought it back to us. I can show you that pleasure of drawing in another way by the project we made for that really stupidly crazy project one day in orders like 10 years ago now, which, which created a kind of, let's say, small mafia along with a lot of small offices that are now big friends with each other. Anyway, we went for that at that time, and I'm happy to show this project, and I have to admit, uh, at that time, I was looking very much to this Sir Lurchens work not redrawing it exactly, but on the other hand, when we made this presentation of the house, which was for us a kind of compilation of seven small houses of 150 square meters towards a house of 1,000 square meters, as we did not understand how big a house of 1,000 could be, we made seven smalls. At the end, we arrived to a set of plans, 47, I believe, in total, in which we drew every brick and the whole young studio we had at that time with about 10 people for weeks, we didn't do anything else than just making all the details for construction of a house of which we were sure it would be never realized. But it went together with a kind of obsessive checkout of things, understanding about domestic things, about space, like in those handmade drawings. 11 pieces of them were made to try to invent and to understand, in fact, what we were doing ourselves, as sometimes it was almost impossible. Models followed. We made a kind of small dictionnaire of all the details that should go along, and we still use that small book sometimes to, or the ideas at least, sometimes to make new projects today. Finally, that project um, arrived at the Venice Biennale, let's say, a kind of uh, last moment we ever showed that it's now in a huge boxes in an archive and we, we, we urgently have to get rid of it. Okay, um, okay this, this was to me, let's say, questioning the idea of reference, how it comes to us so far in our practice. Maybe it's a very light idea on references, but it's, a, on the other hand, very profound to me personally in all kinds of things. Now, let's talk maybe quickly about the idea of teaching and how we work with that. So, first I go back to that exhibition we had at uh, ETH a couple of years ago, which was given the name Carousel as a kind of ongoing thing. So, we had these seven interventions, a few I explained, and Niels Olsen and Freddy Fischli loved them, but they said, 
okay, please do show your work also, because now you have the ideal exhibition space, you have to show it. Once again, we did not show our work. We selected work of other architects, of which we said, well, this work is work that we would have loved to have made ourselves. So we started the exhibition with a selection of 25 projects. You have here in front the Belgian architect, Jo van den Bergen, no one knows. Or there at the back, Jos van Driessen, behind the column of Philippe Oorsprong. Or you see even there the house of René Hevaert. But then throughout the week, the exhibition went on. We send it every week some new material to Niels and Fredi to add to the exhibition to arrive, I believe, at the end with about 33 or more, 30, 43 more projects we handed in. So it was also a continuous project in which we, at our practice, one half a day a week, we invented new projects that we would love to show. And at the end, there was no place enough, and we just had to put it on the ground, or to put it that way. But that made it also interesting for that school students were sneaking in every week to discover new material. But that's the first thing, I believe, which was important to us to understand in referring that maybe referring to your own ideas, it does not need your work. Secondly, we have a studio, we teach, design, or Antwerp, and that studio is called Universum. Remember, Hevaert saying, I want to create myself a kingdom. It's not that we want to create a kingdom, but we believe that it's good for an architect to try to define a universum for himself. And those terminology like carousel and universal, universal I believe they are, of course, open terms. They don't believe in concepts or whatever but they believe in open ideas. So um, we run studios. We did it also at Mendrezio Academy and in Lausanne. And the studios have 14 weeks. And in the first four weeks, we give students just about some project, one photograph or one drawing or whatever. And we ask them to look at it and to try to understand what they see. For example, here. We have two examples of the Smithsons, a school and a house. And we ask them not to be analytic, but to try to understand how space works and to make a drawing out about that. To understand how different materials, how different materials come together as details, and how this can influence the understanding on how space works. And this is a project of a student making this finally in this kind of compiled strange axonometry, starting from studies of this type, of that type, just focusing constantly on the concrete beam, the tiles, the brickworks, and starting to understand or wanting to understand how this space really is defined by its detail. So we start from a reference once again. But we ask them to look at it, not really to be analytically, not really to understand it completely how it works, but how it could work eventually, and by that understand themselves that they could design spaces not by drawing plans and sections, but by starting from out of materializations. And this also goes along, of course, you will not be surprised with our fixation or fascination to make drawings to make analog drawings still. We also work in digitally work, as you've seen. But to try to understand media and how those media can help you in exploring ideas. Another example of two references of a young offset office, a Danish Skofstad, Johansson Skofstad. They get these photographs. They can go on the internet or find out in books how it really works. But we say to them, it's much more pleasant if you don't do and you just try to invent yourself a story of understanding. So this student, for, for example, really worked in a free way in understanding and trying to explore the aspects of space. And then finally, even focused on a very small detail of aluminum window framing versus a wooden cupboard, and then redraw it and redraw it many, many times. So for us, this idea of teaching and this idea of talking with students about possibilities of space, we try to start not from the conception of space, but from the materialization and the detail of space. And I don't think this is a strange idea. I didn't show too much projects this evening, but in the one you've seen, 
you can understand how important it is for ourselves. So this goes subconsequently also in our teaching with students. And this is, I would not say the theme of the studio we have all along our teaching, but it constantly comes every semester, every year back. At ETH, it's not only about studio, it's also about what they call the word research, but I think it's much more about reflection than research. And in the following of the Carousel show in which we showed unknown work, or it was not maybe the topic of really the unknown work, but if which we showed references of others to explain our own thinking, we start up now at uh, ETH a new series of books together with uh, GTA publishers and maybe possibly also um, Walter Koenig, uh, like a set of seven books a year in which we ask our colleagues, first we do it ourselves, and that's what I'm going to show now, but we ask also our colleagues to bring references that they normally do not use. I mean, we all use in our frame of references the usual stuff, and I did not do it myself this evening, and I showed very personal stuff. So I went back to Tom, Tom Emerson, Arnaud, Brandel Huber, uh, Adam also I asked, and, and Bow Wow, if they still could next to their usual discourse at an other reference that they normally do not use. And it was amazed, I was amazed, or was, it was pleasant to discover that everyone almost immediately had some few things that, yes, we really don't know. So we will give ourselves the first startup with three, uh, three of those booklets first. And the first is what uh, work of uh, Jos van Driessen, I guess you will not know, which is a Flemish architect. You might know Julian Lampens, widely spread out, concrete. But Jos van Driessen is, uh, is uh, the same time, but a totally different architect, and you see Fantastic drawings over there. We will catalog them in that booklet. And I just show, we, we always will take one building or one construction or one art piece. This is a work of him near to Ghent. And of course, it is related to its own references from Wright to Alto and many others you could frame. But it's a very beautiful reference which is related to the brickwork and the composition, the beautifully joinery which comes out, a kind of mortar which drips out, of course, you know. And in that small booklet, it will be also related, we're working on that idea still, towards one project. In our case, it will be uh, this project, this is temporary installation for a music festival that, need, that happened in this castle, in the courtyard of the castle, but the castle is always, uh, has been locked down now because of safety reasons. It uh, need to be restored urgently. So the festival didn't have a courtyard anymore. And we quickly drew or designed them a courtyard, which is made out of packages of stones and delivered them again a place to have their music festival in it. At the same moment, at the same site, we were invited to make a pavilion, something like that bus stop. They will start up now a series of pavilions in Flanders, always on nature sites where people could walk to or bike to. And going on with that small budget topic, we took some of those packages and just stacked them as they are stacked in the packages, no real masonry boundary, and poured concrete in it a little bit casted, the moment itself, but later on it delivers this. Maybe it's a small tribute to, my, to Jos van Dries, uh, one of my teachers at that time, next to Julian Lampens. On the other hand, it's a project of which I say, I still don't know what we have done, and I still don't know what we have to do with it. But on the other hand, it is for sure related to what we saw at Jos van Dries' oeuvre for so long time. A second we will present is a French architect, Patrice Moutigny. I don't think he has been documented very much. Back in, back in, the, in the 80s, some magazines can be found. And it's a house for a family, a summer house. It's in fact four houses that come together. And it's a really nice thing of its time. And you see here a kind of details. Philippe Dujardin, again, I, I would say also kind of Americanized architecture in France with an unbelievable, unexpected interior, a house 
which I believe has six staircases because the four houses are vertically organized at the corner of the house. You have a central staircase door, but then you walk through the house with corridors and doors and unexpected fireplaces, going up, finding at another level this type of crazy ensemble, going around like this. And then finally, we connect it to a small work we are about to deliver. It's Flanders again. You have the main house at the back, the roof, you just see it. And then in Flanders, you typically have this back house and another back house and another back house. And we just opened the last back house to be a kind of patio garden. And then connect the real kitchen back towards the garden. It's not that this Moutini was the inspiration for this, not at all, because we found out that house when we were making this house. This is also a house we make with someone who makes this house himself. It takes already two and a half years. But finally, it delivers this interior. So we will now work on that confession series. We are, we hopefully by June, we have the first three, four copies. And then we make a kind of new, small series of books. Um, OK, I don't believe that we are almost there. Let's get out this lecture. Three small things, totally different. This is a photograph I took at uh, San Gotardo in an, on a day in August. And this is the same place another day in August, one year earlier. And it helps us sometimes when we talk in lectures or people ask us things where it could be about architecture. We love to show the both pictures together because it's only a matter of condition. What you don't see at the right picture, you all of a sudden see at the left picture or now in larger scale. And that is where things that have seemingly nothing to do with each other come together. The electricity pile, the traffic sign, the statue with the horse, the small chapel in front, all of a sudden they have a meaning together that you never could see at another moment. Second thing, it's a phrase of Francis Alice, the Belgian artist in Mexico City, though raised as an architect, graduated as an architect. And he wrote this beautiful two sentences. Sometimes doing something poetic can become political. Sometimes doing something political can become poetic. Third thing, the very first project we ever designed leaving school. It's a handmade drawing on checkered paper. And it's a young man inheriting a villa. It was a job of our life being just off school and the young man, though being alone and saying he wanted to stay alone for a long while, he found this beautiful white villa in the suburbs of Brussels, the, bad, the better ones, too small, and he wanted to enlarge it. And as he described it, it was almost a double size of volume. When walking through the house, we found that a strange feeling because it was not a small villa, though one thing was clear that the distance floor ceiling was very low. So we proposed them four drawings to explaining that we wanted to dig out the house into the garden. The garden was fair, large enough, and to take away the floors between basement and ground floor to find the space he was longing for. It took half an hour, and then we were back at the front door. We lost the job, but we thought we found something else. Anyway, if you want to document yourself more, we made this book series now like five years ago, I think, something like this on the occasion of the Venice Biennale 2010 and the exhibition at the single 2011 on our work, which is a collection of drawings, ideas in the first and the third book and the writings in the middle book, people commenting our work and so on. And more recently, we had the chance the last three, four years to be um, to have been made a 2G, which was not, it was published digital, but not printed. So to have an, sorry, a Deidebus, which was a very expensive one, but a very nice one. And recently, 
to have made an ANU monograph on our work. But uh, together with Moritz Kuhn, we made a new kind of triptych monograph out of it, which is now in a box. All the books are cut at the same size, and the 2G is a reboot, or a, a, a bootleg, sorry, of the 2G that was never printed, but only digital available. But we photographed a specific print. Also, this idea is for us important. It's not that we are lazy and we refuse to make another book, but we thought it was interesting to rework again with our own work or our own books, in this case, towards a new book set. And it goes together. Uh, it's Moritz Kung who uh, made the whole concept while well, together with us. And it goes together with a kind of extra insert of Kung's talking about books on architecture. Final slide. In the CNU, we wrote a text. And I just put the third or the fourth line. References is not a matter of references. Thank you. Thank you.